Hey everybody, I'm Chili. Welcome back to Intermediate C++ Tutorial 16. Today, the topic is going to be algorithms. Uh, we saw in the last video the whole motivation for using iterators in the first place. And it's the ability to write generic algorithms that will run on any container. Now, let's see some of the pre-made algorithms that the standard library provides us with and look at some techniques for putting them to use in our code. This is going to save us a lot of code writing time, a lot of debugging time, and is generally going to help us write clean, robust, idiomatic, modern C++ code. Is that enough modifiers for you? C++ programmers love modifiers. So let's start off our tour of the algorithms library with the function sort. You know, sorting is a pretty fundamental operation. A lot of more complex algorithms require you to sort your shit. The standard library sort takes an iterator the first and the last element in a range, and it will sort that range. Pretty simple. Most of the algorithms that we're going to be using today can be found in the header algorithm. So we've got a vector of ints vi, and we want to sort that guy. We call std sort, and we call vi.begin, and vi.end, if we want to sort the whole thing. And there you go, our shit is sorted. Guess it'd probably be better if I jumbled it up a little bit. Uh, now we gotta write the result out to the screen. And if you run that, you get your shit sorted. Looks like I used the one twice. Yeah, here and here. Now the reference page for sort gives us a lot of information. Uh, let's go over it a little bit here. Tells you what header it is in. Uh, tells you what overloads you have. You can ignore these guys here, 2 and 4, because they're for C++ 17. Um, and let me see here. Elements are compared with the operator less than. That's just giving you explanations of you know these different versions here. What the parameters mean. Very important is the type requirements because your types that you pass to this templated function, they must fulfill all these requirements or you're gonna get nasty errors. So random iterator must meet the requirements of random access iterator. So right now we can see, oh shit, we can't use sort on a list. So how do you sort a goddamn list or a forward list? Well, list and forward list, they actually have member functions for sorting. So you have to call the member function if you want to sort those guys. But let me warn you, it's going to be a hell of a lot slower than on a vector. Another reason why we don't use lists. Another important thing to look for is that the, the type has to match these parameters. So the actual thing that is being stored in the vector, it's got to match this stuff. And a lot of times you're going to have, when you have your own custom types, you're going to have ones that don't match and you have to find a way around that. And, you know, the, uh, the predicate, the, the function used to compare, that has to meet the uh, requirements of compare. And these things here, these names here, these are called concepts. And uh, they define a set of requirements that a type has to meet. So you can look, you can click on any of these ones and get the details about what requirements each concept has. So the simplest version of sort uses the less than operator to sort the elements in ascending order. What if you want to sort in descending order? Well, you can pass it a uh, functor that will perform the greater than comparison and that will sort it in the opposite order. Now in the standard library, there's a functional library that uh, provides stuff to allow you to do functional programming. Uh, and that's a little advanced for where we're at right now, but it also supplies a bunch of stock function objects that you can use in your uh, algorithms. So the one that is being used right now is the less um, functor. We want to use the greater functor to sort in the opposite order. So what do we do? Well, we can include functional in here, and now we can just pass the functor for greater. So we go std, greater and we have to template it on the type which is int and then we create the functor and there you go if you run this you're going to get it in the opposite order nine to zero now custom types can also be sorted in a container let's say i got a class dude you know it's got a few uh, fields here id x y got a function of print got a constructor and i make a bunch of those guys i want to sort them print them out now there's one thing missing here if i try to compile this you're going to see a whole ass ton of errors here and this is the hallmark of templates they give you a bunch of fucking errors now the problem here is that the sorting the the functor that it uses less it needs to be able to compare dudes but there is no comparison operator defined for these guys but if we give it a comparison operator a less than operator and we'll make it compare ids between the two now we see it compiles fine. And you'll see if we run that, they're now sorted by ID in ascending order. 
Now in a game, an RPG game like think Chrono Trigger or Secret of Mana, you often want to sort your sprites in the Y axis so that you can draw them in the correct order so things that are supposed to be in front will appear in front of things that are supposed to be behind. Uh, so we, if we want to sort in the Y axis, how do we do that? We've already defined our operator here. We do want to sort also by ID. How do we change the sort to sort in the Y axis? Well, we could define our own custom functor here. So let's go class, and we'll call this one uh, Y less. And it's going to need a uh, bool operator. And it's the function operator, and it's going to take constant dude left hand side and right hand side. And then in here, we just do lhs.y is less than rhs.y. So here's our functor, because it's an inner class, it has access to the private members, that's nice. And then if we want to sort by y, all we got to do is pass it dude y less and uh, construct that. Warning, a less operator has no effect. Uh, it's always good if you actually return the result of the operation. And here we go, we see our shit is now sorted in ascending Y value. Very nice. Now there is a technique for quickly removing items from a container. With the normal uh, erase function, if you erase an item like this one here, you've now got a gap in the container and it's got to copy over all of the items that follow. So if you've got a million items, you could potentially have to copy a million items every time you erase one, and that's slow. Uh, what you can do is, if you don't care about the order of elements, when you erase an element, you can destroy the object in here, and then you can move this one from here into here, so now five is here, and then you can just pop off the end, like this. And now you still have all the same elements. The order has changed though, but it's very fast. Instead of having to copy, you know, a million elements, you've really only got to copy one element. Again, this technique is called removal, and I'm going to be using it in Project Twin. But there's also functions in the standard library that can enable this. So there's remove, which takes a value and removes all the ones that match that value. And then there's remove if, which removes all the ones that match a certain predicate, a certain functor. And the way it works is simple, it destroys all of the elements that match and then it moves in from the back to fill in those positions. Now here's the important part. The return value is very important here, the past the end iterator for the new range of values. Um, so in general, the iterator can destroy objects at an element and it can move uh, objects from one element to another but it can't actually resize the container. So there will be garbage elements. If you do remove if, for example, and it uh, removes this one and this one, it is going to you know, move these guys like this, and these guys are gonna be like this, but there's still gonna be these two garbage elements at the end of the container. So what it does is it will return an iterator to the new end position. So before the end position was here, and then after the remove if, it was here. And now you have to use that to basically resize the container afterwards and clean up the garbage. Get that trash out of here. All right, let's take remove if out for a test drive, shall we? First thing we need is iterators to determine the beginning and end of the sequence on which we're gonna work. And we're just gonna go on the entire container. And the next thing is we need a predicate that determines which elements are removed. And this predicate is gonna be a unary predicate. Now we could create the predicate by uh, putting a nested class inside of dude, but let's do it a little different. So you can see here I added get x and get y to dude so that we can access the values of these uh, members and then I created this class here, it's a functor, and this is going to be the predicate for our remove if. And it, it implements the operator here obviously, takes a dude and that is going to determine whether to uh, to remove that dude or not. Now it also, different than some of our other uh, functors that we've been creating, uh, this one has a constructor and that constructor is going to store the uh, the threshold value to compare all of the dude y's with to see whether or not they should be removed. So if we want to use this predicate, and you might be interested in noting that we can create classes in the local scope of a function, there's no problem with that. So we can do this and then we just got to create the, uh, the functor and we've got to construct it with a threshold value, let's just threshold on 10. And there you go, now we've removed. 
Now, after we perform the removal, generally the end of the uh, container is going to contain some garbage values, and you're going to want to get rid of those. Now, I said we can re we should resize the container, but using resize is actually kind of a problem because if we resize, uh, the resize function has the ability to shrink the container or to grow the container. And if it grows the container, it's going to want to construct new elements. It's going to want to default construct them, but we don't have a default constructor for dude. So resize isn't the greatest. Instead, we're going to use erase. And you might say, well, we're using the whole point of this remove technique is to avoid erasing. But erasing is only bad if you're erasing from the front and you have to bump up a bunch of elements. Erasing from the back is fast and there's no problem with it. And that's the only place we're going to be erasing in this situation. So first we go const auto uh, new end is equal to this. So remove if we we'll return the new end of the container. And then we just got to erase from new end to the, uh, the current end. And if you run that, you see that seven and six are the only ones that remain. All the rest have been culled because they're above the threshold. We set the threshold of 50, we'll get a little bit of a different result. Now we get 7, 22, 18, and 6. The only one that was cold was the 62. And this algorithm is great. I use it all the time for games. Like let's say you've got a vector of bullets and you process all the bullets and if they hit something, you set a flag on them saying that they should die. And then after you've processed all the bullets, you run remove if, you check those flags, and you get rid of all the bullets that have died because they hit something. Now this system of using algorithms works anytime we need a custom predicate, you know, we could create a class like this, standalone, local or global, or we could create a class that is nested inside of another class. But it seems kind of a pain in the ass every time we want to run an algorithm, we got to create a new one of these classes. Uh, there must be a better way, and there is. It's called motherfucking lambda functions, and they are sweet. So let's check them out. Now right, let's replace this functor class with a lambda. So what we're going to do, put a new line in there, like that. Now lambda, to give it, to make a lambda, you got square brackets, you need round brackets, and then you need braces. And this creates a lambda, it creates a functor object. So it's not just creating a class, this actually creates an object, and this is now a, uh, this is now a functor. Uh, so what do these mean? Well, square brackets, we'll get to those in a second. Round braces are where the parameters are passed in every time the functor is called. So here, we're going to want constant dude reference to dude. And uh, braces are where the actual body of the code goes. So what are we going to be doing here? We're going to do a threshold. So we're going to uh, return dude.getY greater than 10. If we run that, it works. And it has performed the threshold operation. So what gives here? Well, uh, a lot of syntax. Start off with the basics. You might be wondering, where is the return value? Here we got to specify that this returns a bool. Where do we specify the return value? Well, it actually deduces the return value from this statement. But if you have to specify it for some reason, you can specify it like this, with an arrow and then the return type. But usually, that's not necessary. Now, the next thing you might be wondering about is, well, with threshold test y, we could use the constructor to parameterize this to give to choose its uh, threshold value. Here we're just hard coding the threshold value. How would we choose a threshold value? Let's say we've got some variable outside of here. We'll call it my poop. How do we get this uh, lambda to use my poop for the threshold? Well, the answer is we capture it. So we type in these square brackets. This is the lambda capture, uh, and we can capture my poop and then we can use my poop here note that if we didn't capture it uh, this would underline red well IntelliSense made a liar out of me it doesn't underline red but it does not compile either it says cannot be captured uh, so you have to put the name in here then it is captured and then it runs now there are a lot of different ways that you can capture uh, variables. So let's go over them. First of all, this way of capturing is called capturing by value. And what it essentially does is it, inside of the functor object, it creates, you know, a variable, uh, my poop, and that will be accessible inside here. And it just copies the captured value into 
the, uh, the variable in the functor. You can also put an ampersand in front and that will capture by reference instead of capturing by value, which is useful if you want to modify the thing outside of the functor or if you don't want to copy it because it's fucking huge. Uh, you can capture by reference instead. Now, if you put in equals in here, what this will tell it, tell it is to capture everything that it uses. So now it'll capture everything outside of the lambda function that it uses by value. And if you put an ampersand, that tells it capture everything it uses by reference. Now you can also capture uh, by a different name. So you can go thresh is equal to my poop. And then we can use thresh inside of here and it will work. And you can even do an expression here. So you can say thresh is equal to my poop plus 10 and now it will capture the value of my poop plus 10. So now it's thresholding on 30. If you're writing a lambda function inside of a member function and you want to use the members of the object on which that member function was called, you can capture the this pointer and then you can use the members inside of here. It doesn't work here because this isn't a member function, it's just main, but you can capture the this pointer and then you can call things as if you were a member function. Now, one thing that people often overlook when they learn lambdas is, uh, well, let's say you're capturing something by value, right? Uh, but you actually want to increment the value inside the lambda every time you call the lambda function. This would give you what is called a stateful lambda, right? The state of the lambda can change uh, in every call. And you can do this, but the compiler is not going to like it unless you put immutable right here. And that will allow you to change the values of the things that you have captured by value. Note that this won't change uh, my poop outside of the lambda. It only changes the, the copy of my poop that is stored in the lambda functor object. So yeah, you have a lot of options uh, when you're dealing with captures here, uh, but don't feel overwhelmed. You know, you're going to see me give examples of this stuff, especially in future tutorials in Project Twin. But also, if you're interested, you can uh, maybe do a little bit of research on your own. Look up an article online on Lambda functions and uh, obviously do experimentation and practice on your own. Just one last thing here, this statement creates a functor object. It doesn't actually do anything or have any side effects. If you want to create a functor, functor object and then call it, you could put brackets behind here and pass it its parameter. So this statement here creates a lambda functor and then calls the functor and then the functor is destroyed. If you want to keep the functor and call it multiple times, what you can do is you can go auto my lamb is equal to this and this will now store the lambda in a variable here and then you could call the lambda yourself or you could pass it to a uh, an algorithm so you can store lambda functions in variables and then use them later on but usually i prefer to put them in line like this now one of the things about c that people don't really realize when they start is they they start to use string and they're like where's the function to convert this string to all lowercase or all uppercase and the thing is is there is no built-in function for that the c standard library isn't about spoon feeding you every single specific little operation that you need to do what it does is it gives you the building blocks the general legos of things like algorithm and you can put them together to do whatever the hell you want Sure, it's not as straightforward, it's not as easy, but it's a hell of a lot more powerful once you figure out how to use it. For example, if you want to convert a string to all lowercase, you use std transform and you use the to lower function which converts a single character to a lowercase and you run that over the entire string with the transform algorithm. All right, so now you got the tools to enable you to put algorithms to work, and I'll give you an example of a couple of them. It's time to learn the actual algorithms, and I've got two things for you. First of all, I got a bunch of homework for you. So I've got a bunch of uh, problems here that you can solve. You're going to download this uh, CPP file from the wiki page, and you are going to solve all these problems that I posed to you. Second thing I got for you is a little bonus problem in the sprite repo. I want you to implement this sprite effect for uh, the animation. And uh, I want you to implement it using a lambda, okay?
So those problems should give you a good head start on exploring and learning the algorithm library on your own. Now, another thing I was going to do was I was going to do a part two of this video where I basically over, do an overview of the entire algorithm library and take a deep look into a few of the more common functions. But I tried that, ended up being too long, too boring. So what I'm thinking of doing here is maybe doing a little mini series where I do bite-sized video, I select a few gems from the uh, algorithm library, you know, a function or a few related functions, and I do a short video, you know, maybe 8 to 14 minutes long. And I'll just release little nuggets like that every now and then, just little gems from the algorithm library. And I'll give examples on how they can help you, you know, make games and do cool shit. Uh, and that's an idea anyways. If I get a lot of interest for this, I will make it. If not, then I will forget about it. So uh, if you're interested in, you know, a little series of bite-sized gems from the standard library, hit me up in the comments or on Twitter. Let your voice be heard and uh, maybe it'll become a thing. Anyways, until next time, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more C++.